KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF 88.1 in Fresno, K248BR 97.5 in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. Root Awakening is next. Stay tuned. Good morning, folks. This is a rude awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll speak to Extinction Rebellion San Francisco Bay Action Coordinator Leah Redwood on their lead up week of Actions to Earth Day. And I'll have a conversation with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District's Gary Nudd on EB 617, the Community Health Protection Program. And then we'll close out the hour in discussion with Dar Jamal on his latest piece in the Cairo Review of Global Affairs entitled a future filled with pathogens. But first, the news. I'm Eileen Alfandari with KPFA News Headlines. President Trump says it will be up to governors to decide when to reopen their state's economies. He outlined new guidelines for what he called a phased and deliberate approach. They make clear the return to normalcy will be a far longer process than Trump initially envisioned. The first phase recommends strict physical distancing for all people in public, with gatherings larger than 10 people to be avoided. Non-essential travel would be discouraged. Phase two, people would be encouraged to maximize physical distancing and limit gatherings to no more than 50 people. Travel could resume. Phase three envisions a return to normalcy for most. Trump said recent trends in some states were so positive they could almost immediately begin taking the steps laid out in phase one. Christopher Martinez reports. Just three days ago, President Donald Trump claimed total authority to end coronavirus lockdowns, saying the President of the United States calls the shots. On Thursday, he reversed course. Governors will be empowered to tailor an approach If they need to remain closed, we will allow them to do that. And if they believe it is time to reopen, we will provide them the freedom and guidance to accomplish that task and very, very quickly. Trump's plan has what it calls gating criteria that states or regions must meet before moving to the next phase of loosening coronavirus measures. Those gates include 14 days of declining cases, and assuring the ability of hospitals to treat COVID-19 patients without needing crisis care. There's no timeline for each phase. Trump is leaving that timing up to the governors. I'm Christopher Martinez. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi called Trump's guidelines vague and inconsistent. Her statement said that the plan, quote, does nothing to make up for the president's failure to listen to the scientists and produce and distribute national rapid testing. Pelosi's statement echoed the plea of governors for more testing and contact tracing capabilities. Russian President Vladimir Putin is prodding top officials to move faster to prepare for a surge in coronavirus cases. Putin spoke on a conference call with top Russian federal official and regional governors. He told them to act faster and more energetically to secure ventilators, protective gear and other essential supplies. Putin warned Russia is yet to see a peak of infections. The country has registered 32,000 coronavirus cases and 273 deaths. African nations could suffer 300,000 deaths from the coronavirus this year, even under the best case scenario. That's according to a report from the UN Economic Commission for Africa. It says under the worst case scenario, 3.3 million people could die on the African continent. The head of the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, John Nkengasong, said it's possible African nations will need to carry out 15 million tests over the next three months. He said coronavirus cases on the continent are surging. As of today, this morning, about 17,200 uh, individuals have been, uh, were, have, have been infected on the continent. Last week when we met, The cases were 46% lower than it is today. So you can see that we have almost uh, increased by 50% the number of cases from last week to, to this week. He added officials have recorded 910 deaths. 
The government's Paycheck Protection Loan Program for small businesses is on hold. The Small Business Administration announced it has reached the $349 billion lending limit. Thousands of small business owners whose loans weren't yet processed must now wait for Congress to approve a Trump administration request for another $250 billion. Republicans want to extend the program as it stands now. Democrats have insisted on provisions to help small rural, tribal, and minority and women-owned businesses that don't have established relationships with the commercial banks that are processing the loan requests. Democrats also want funds for health care providers and state and local governments. California Governor Gavin Newsom has signed an order granting two weeks of paid sick leave to farm workers, delivery drivers, grocery store and fast food employees so they won't feel pressured to keep working while infected with the coronavirus. Luana Muniz reports. Governor Gavin Newsom's executive order will benefit farm workers, workers in grocery stores, fast food chains and delivery services. The executive order also increases health and safety standards for workers at fast food facilities allowing them to wash their hands every 30 minutes or as needed. We just want folks to know they don't have to work when they're sick if they've been exposed, quarantined, been told to isolate, uh, or have uh, a positive test of COVID-19. And I think all of us would agree uh, that people delivering the food, uh, people picking the food, uh, people that are cooking the food and serving the food, uh, all of us would prefer they're safe and healthy as well. The governor's executive order is supposed to fill a gap left by the federal relief bill, since companies with more than 500 workers were left out of the federal paid sick leave. The governor also disclosed the latest COVID-19 numbers. At least 69 individuals have died of COVID-19 in the last 24 hours, raising the state's coronavirus death toll to 890. I'm Luana Muniz, reporting for KPFA. The Trump administration is gutting an Obama-era rule that compelled coal and oil fire power plants to cut back emissions of mercury and other human health hazards. EPA Chief Andrew Wheeler said the rollback was reversing what he called regulatory overreach by the Obama administration. Coal fire power plants are the largest single source of mercury pollutants. The Union of Concerned Scientists called the move a cynical and dangerous decision. A new study finds much of the western United States is baking in what scientists call an emergency mega drought. The study in the journal Science blames almost half the problem on global carbon emissions. Multi-decade severe droughts happen every couple hundred of years. The current one is one of the most dire since the year 800. With the forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area, mostly cloudy, highs in the 60s. In Fresno and the central San Joaquin Valley, mostly cloudy, chance of showers, slight chance of afternoon thunderstorms, highs in the lower 70s. I'm Eileen Alfandari. More news at 94.1 with headlines at noon. Join us at 6 for the Pacifica Evening News. This week marks KPFA's 71st birthday, 71 years and still going strong as the flagship of all that is independent and representative of free speech. I want to say thank you so very much to everyone that was able to give on our special day. And if you were not able to, rest assured, you can do it securely online at kpfa.org. Every little bit counts, especially during these unprecedented times. Again, thank you, community. We're going to go ahead and start the show off uh, with Earth Day, folks. As some of you already know, Earth Day 50. This is the 50th year of Earth Day. It's coming up next week on the 22nd. Since most of us are trying to do the right thing and shelter in place, there are a number of week-long online events that will be happening right at your fingertips. That includes events put on by... Extinction Rebellion, San Francisco Bay. I spoke to Extinction Rebellion, San Francisco Bay Action Coordinator and lifelong activist Leah Redwood about what is on the agenda for next week's Enlightening Online Celebration. Now, um, how much difficulty have you found or how easy has it been for you to to move your actions um, and, and organizing online as opposed to putting your bodies out there? 
Um, you know, there's definitely uh, obstacles to, to address and um, things that need to be shifted, but it also really allows a, just a wide variety of people from, you know, all over the place to come together. We have been doing um, lately kind of what we're calling regenerative activism. Um, every Friday from 12 to 1, we've been holding a regenerative activism call where we start the hour with uh, laughing yoga or qigong or something that um, is really uh, you know, helpful to, to regenerate and to make us all feel well. And then we move into a time of doing some activism where we all uh, make a call or post on post to a social media platform. Um, so it's a really great way to come together. And uh, recently we even had somebody all the way from Boston on our call. So it just allows a much broader reach and that's a really great thing. And uh, that is uh, really being developed in what is now uh, being the exciting next thing for activism, which is Earth Day Live, which is coming up next week. Uh, next Wednesday, a week from today, is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And, um, you know, it's really disappointing for many people to not be able to go out and clean the beaches and do all the amazing work that so many people have done on environment um, during those Earth Days over all these years. But uh, a, the Youth Climate Strike Organization has put together an incredible event. It's uh, three days, uh, April 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Um, where each day has a theme and there's going to be um, online live stream all, all day, basically, each of those days with incredible content. Um, not only are they going to have people from the climate movement and other movements like Bill McKibben and William Barber from the Poor People's Campaign, but they're yes. going to have um, well-known uh, echo activists and celebrities like... Um, Joaquin Phoenix, uh, Rosanna Arquette, uh, you know, lots of people that are, um, you know, really behind this movement and will be really interesting to hear what they have to say. So, uh, and, and there's also going to be local content during this live stream. So particularly on the 23rd, uh, that day, the theme of the day is divestment. And so we have two hours where local content is particularly uh, invited. And so from 9 to 10 a.m. on Thursday, the 23rd, and from 4 to 5 p.m. on Thursday, the 23rd, uh, the local San Francisco Climate Justice Folks Council organization, which Extinction Rebellion is part of, is putting on two live stream events. So we're really excited to have people come join us and learn more about divestment and participate in some fun activities. Um, so yeah, hope your listeners will join us. Absolutely. So, um, and this is to coincide with the 50th anniversary of Earth Day on April 22nd, yeah. the 50th anniversary yeah. of Earth Day. Now, where can people get all of this information? Because um, I, I'm seeing uh, from different uh, varying websites, uh, folks are saying that it's starting, or the uh, websites are stating that it's starting uh, on the 19th of April and running through the 26th of April. And then uh, some are pointing out uh, other dates, and then you've got some dates too. So where can people get that cohesive yeah. information? Yeah, um, the the event that I'm connected to is called Earth Day Live, okay. and the website for that is earthdaylive2020.org, and that's specifically focused on the three-day, 72-hour um, live stream, which is April 22nd through the 24th. I know that um, people are doing other events outside of that time, but this is what we're connected to. And if you go to that website, you can RSVP to get information. You can see who the big names are that are going to be involved. You're going to see um, a map that's going to show you events all over the country. And 
uh, uh, where they're located. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's got all the information there. All right. So Earth Day Live 2020, Earth Day Live 2020. That's uh, coinciding with Earth Day. All these fun events online, unfortunately, but fortunately. Um, and um, yeah, this, yeah. Is, <laughs> this is a wonderful thing. Yeah. It is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah, and they're expecting about great. 2 billion people or so, right? If not more. Yeah, I mean, I haven't. I haven't heard the the estimation uh, <laughs> at this point, but I think the word is going out far and wide. So there is, you know, the national live stream is going to be going on from nine in the morning till nine at night. There's going to be teachings, music, dance parties, you know, all kinds of things going on. Um, it's, it won't just be people talking at you. So um, mm-hmm. definitely participatory thing. So tune in whenever you can and, and be part of this because it's a really important moment for us to all come together. Absolutely. I think you guys are taking advantage of, you know, this 50th anniversary. This is, a, you know, a momentous occasion, of course. And also um, the fact that uh, we're looking at an unprecedented time uh, in this world where the air is clear and it's clean and, you know, the, 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 uh, the greenhouse admit, uh, gas emissions are, are, are down and, and um, people can, you know... It, it, the the world is 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 visible from the atmosphere from outside the atmosphere from from space you know i think this, this yeah. is just an amazing yeah. moment amazing amazing moment now folks can also if they have an event that they want to register they can also do that at the uh, earthday.org um event registration definitely. website right definitely okay I- I think the time is running down when new new things can be uh, put up, but I think, you know, definitely go for it. If you have an idea of something that you want to put out there, um, you know, it's very inclusive. Um, and yeah, I do want to acknowledge that, you know, we obviously are very cognizant of the fact that many people are being affected by uh, the pandemic situation that we all find ourselves in. Right. And we want to be acknowledging that and supportive and um, reaching out in mutual aid. And we also want to be pointing out the ways that uh, the business as usual is still operating. Um, and in fact, you know, pipeline construction is still going on. And so we still need to work to, to, you know, put the message out and um, end the situation uh, that's causing so many people so much difficulty, uh, you know, uh, and so many animals and uh, the world in general. Uh, we, we really need to keep that message uh, going. So. Absolutely. So we've got the global teaching, environmental education, we've got an Earth Challenge. Um, just amazing. This this website is just it's all inclusive, just like our guest has already stated, Miss Leah yeah. Redwood. Miss Leah Redwood yeah. um, is a longtime activist, a lifelong activist, as well as being a, a former midwife. <laughs> and man, you've just been you've been at it and you haven't stopped, it sounds like to me. And I really, truly appreciate you taking the time to talk to us here at A Root Awakening. Leah Redwood, is there anything else you'd like to add to let folks know about this upcoming um, week-long event? Um, uh, yeah, just, you know, be part of it. I think it's a time, like I said, for all of us to come together and and realize that, you know, we see in this moment that we can make a change. We can do something that shifts business as usual in a pretty dramatic way in a pretty short time. And this is what uh, so many people are calling for in relation to the climate emergency. So let's see how we can use this experience that we're having in a beneficial way in the long term and make that change. So I encourage everybody to come be part of this and figure out how to move forward together into into that new future. All right. 
That's it. EarthDay.org. EarthDay.org. Go to the website. Get signed up. Get ready. It's going to be a momentous occasion. Leah Redwood of Extinction Rebellion, San Francisco Bay Area. I truly appreciate you taking the time and being on A Rude Awakening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having having me. And uh, I look forward to seeing you out there. Definitely. In that online world. (laughs) Virtual. Be there or be square. And now we're going to switch gears and present a rebuttal to my colleague, Andres Soto, representative from Communities for a Better Environment. Uh, a rebuttal to his position that he presented last week on A Rude Awakening that Bachmed, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, isn't doing enough to implement AB 617, the Community Health Protection Program in the hard hit communities of color, um, which are Richmond and West Oakland. I spoke to Greg Nudd, the Deputy Air Pollution Control Officer for Bachman, and we started our conversation by discussing the correlation of redlining and air pollution. Well, let me ask you this. Um, with those same maps, right, that red line, that initial redlining from the 30s and 40s like you're just speaking about, and then you look at that additional redlining as uh, that next layer, if you would, where freeways have been built. Can we add that third layer of where those five oil refineries are in the Bay Area in addition to those two other layers? Um, those five oil refineries are in those same same uh, low-income uh, communities of color, correct? Not uniformly. Um, so not uniformly, not uniformly. But, they, they, but the effects... But what about the effects? So, I, I, you know, you'd have to look at them kind of refinery by refinery. So, and community okay. by community. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, sure. You know, uh, the clearest example, of course, is Richmond, where you've got the biggest refinery in the Bay Area. Um, you've got three rail lines going through. You've got three freeways running through. And so you have this, you know, this uh, confluence of all of those sources in Richmond. Um, it's a little bit more complicated if you're looking at, say, um, South Vallejo, which is another low-income community of color that we're concerned about. They get some pollution from across the strait from Phillips 66. They get some from the refinery in Benicia. Um, but if you look at a community like Martinez, which has two refineries, um, there's not a lot of low-income community of color in that immediate area. Um, and then there's little pockets. There is a um, a public housing complex built literally on the fence line of Phillips 66. Uh, and, and so you see it, it's not something that you can kind of uniformly say in the case of the refineries, well, they're all in these low-income communities of color. But what I can say is that um, certainly uh, we've got some big concerns about Phillips 66. Um, and Galero and Benicia, depending on which way the wind is blowing, um, and and in uh, and Chevron and uh, in Richmond. So we've got these, uh, you know. So that's a lot. Of what what I spend probably the majority of my time on right now is dealing with these um, disproportionately impacted communities across the Bay Area. Uh, the other big concern we have right now is, is particulate matter, and. You may be aware that today the Environmental Protection Agency decided not to uh, increase the stringency of the national air quality standard for uh, particulate matter. And the way the Trump administration came to that conclusion is that they fired all the scientists off the scientific review board 
And then right, they, right, and that that happened back about that happened right after uh, Trump took office when they just decimated the Environmental Protection Agency on the federal level. Correct. Um, this particular thing happened literally today. Um, the Trump administration. Whoa. The Trump administration today okay. announced that they would not be lowering the standard for particulate matter. Um, even though every scientist in the country says that the current standard is not health protective. And we had this more recent data that shows that long-term exposure to particulate matter is a strong predictor of coronavirus death rates. And so in light of all this data, the Trump administration is just ignoring the epidemiology, ignoring the scientists, and moving forward with a policy that really only benefits the big polluters. Um, so we're, you know, at the Air District, we're struggling with, um, without this support from the federal government, what what measures can we take to to uh, reduce particulate matter exposure, especially in those disproportionately uh, impacted communities? Um, air toxics are a big concern of ours as well. We have uh, a couple of years ago we passed the most stringent air toxic regulation in the country. And we're in the process of implementing that now. Um, and air toxics it can be, you know, the, the sources of that can be surprising. Um, sometimes they're obvious, right? A, a big tank farm full of gasoline is going to be a big air toxic source. But uh, the neighborhood charboiler restaurant is also a big air toxic source if you're close enough to it. Uh, another concern we have with air toxics is with magnet sources, and these are sources that attract trucks and ships. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, ever noticed the big uh, post office distribution center in West Oakland that attracts hundreds of trucks back and forth every day. There's no clear framework in the current air quality regulations to, to address that source. And so we've been working with the legislature to try and get some additional authority so we can do that. The other big concern we have um, which uh, you know the current pandemic has caused to magically disappear is uh, vehicle miles traveled. Um, getting back to particulate matter, uh, you may have read recently that the largest source of microplastics in the San Francisco Bay is uh, tire wear. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. And what our data okay. what our data is showing right now is that um, if you're driving a new gasoline powered car, most of the pollution comes from brake and tire wear and from kicking up dust that's already on the road because the tailpipe emissions have gotten pretty low. And so even if everybody converted to electric cars um, tomorrow, we would still have way too much uh, particulate matter pollution from cars. And so figuring out a way to address that, um, which gets back to issues like uh, land use and um, infill housing and access to transportation and, and those kind of questions. So you know, those are the five big things that we're, we're worrying about right now. And just kind of want to circle back to how climate pollutants mix in with that. A lot of these air toxics and, and most of the particulate matter, with the exception of what I just mentioned with the brake and tire wear and road dust, come from the combustion of fossil fuels. So the more we can move away from dependence on fossil fuels as we try and meet our climate goals, the, the better um, the, we'll be able to realize these benefits in these locally harmful pollutants as well. It's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation, though, if, um, you know, and, and cars are a good example of that. Electric cars probably produce, you know, two-thirds as much particulate matter pollution as gasoline-powered cars. Um, a gas station is a big source of air toxics, but not a source of climate pollutants. So it's not, you know, a completely straightforward situation, but but generally, the, the quicker we move off of fossil fuels, the better off we'll be, not just from a climate perspective, but from a, a public health perspective. 
No doubt, no doubt. All right, well, folks, I'm talking to Greg Nudd, and he serves as Deputy Air Pollution Control Officer, oversees the public policy programs at the Air District. That is the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, uh, including the Rural Development Team, the Planning and Climate Protection Division, the Public Health Office, and the Community Engagement Team. Now, Mr. Nudd, it's my understanding with the cap and trade extension, all carbon dioxide reduction has been left to, uh, shall we call it the pollution trading market. How did or does that impact your rulemaking process and your approach, your team's approach to the toxic and criteria pollutants that go hand in hand with the CO2 and, and that have such an impact, a terrible impact on community health? It complicates things for sure. Um, I <laughs> No doubt, no doubt. Uh, one of the, just to, to, to be completely clear, if you look across the whole um, economy and all of the sources of, of climate pollutants, um, what cap and trade addresses is just the industrial sources. Um, and so uh, it's not the whole of, of climate the climate program is all dependent on cap and trade. And in fact, the only reason we're meeting our state climate goals is because of all the progress that's being made in the electricity generation sector due to uh, the renewable portfolio standard. And so um, the cap and trade sources really haven't shown much actual reduction over the life of the cap and trade program. And that certainly gives us some um, concern here at the Air District because you know we're trying to map out a way to get to our climate goals to meet our to meet our climate uh, our emission reduction goals in the, in the Air District's climate plan. And those um, those large industrial sources that are subject to cap and trade not making any visible progress uh, has been a, a big concern for us. We had. Uh, previously um, proposed a regulation that would have capped refinery greenhouse gas emissions, but we lost the authority to do that as part of the um, passage of AB 32. And so it did tie our hands on what we can do in the climate space, and uh, we have been looking at um, other things we can do in the meantime. We have also been uh, looking at what's going on in the legislature and um, you know, looking for opportunities there for some, some statewide changes that we think would make a difference. In terms of how it impacts our ability to protect the public from, um, from air quality pollutants, things like particulate matter and air toxics, it complicates it a little bit because, you know, our clean air plan was designed to be a comprehensive plan that addressed climate and air quality at the same time. And so we kind of got to, you know, go with one hand tied behind our back. Um, but we do have a lot of authority to address air toxics, a lot of authority to address particulate matter, and we're moving on that right now. Um, as I mentioned before, we have the most stringent air toxics regulation in the country. And we're implementing that now. Um, we're currently developing three new rules to reduce particulate matter and air toxic emissions from the refineries. And those are on track to be completed this year. And through the AB 617 process, and this you know, harkens back to what I was talking about um, before regarding the disproportionately impacted communities. So uh, AB 617, which I believe you discussed in your last um, the last uh, episode is a state law that was passed mm -hmm. to uh, address these disproportionate impacts in, in these communities. Um, last year, we completed an emission reduction plan for West Oakland, and we are currently laying the groundwork for an emission reduction plan in the Richmond. And, you know, it, our perspective on those community scale um, plans there's a couple of things I want to say about that. They have to be community developed. And that means you've got to have a process in place where the community leads the decision making. 
And so what we're doing now is we're working with a design team made up of community members in Richmond to talk about who's going to be on that committee, um, what is the voting going to look like, how are we going to get input from industry without allowing the industry to dominate the conversation. And so while all of that is going on, we're also doing a lot of homework in Richmond to figure out where are the air pollution hotspots and to begin the process of what we call source apportionment, which is we find the air pollution hotspot and then we say, okay, for this particular hotspot, um, and by hotspot I mean an area that has higher exposure to air pollution than similar um, neighborhoods in the community and say, for this particular hotspot, what's driving that exposure? Is it the freeway? Is it the refinery? Is it the railroad tracks? Is it the neighborhood barbecue? Um, And so we kind of got two parallel paths going. One is developing that community decision-making structure. On the other hand, on the other path, we're implementing regulations we've already developed. Developing new regulations. And where is that? And where? Where is that community development come? I mean, where is that? Has that just started? Is that a process that just started? Or where? Where in the process are you as far as creating these uh, steering committees for the community? So we put together. A, so we're going in a two-phase plan for Richmond. Um, the first phase of the Richmond plan was to answer a question that we've been puzzling over for several years. Um, which is we've got regulatory grade monitors in San Pablo and in Berkeley and in San Rafael. And all of those kind of triangulate around Richmond. And if you look at the air quality data from our monitors and from monitors that are operated by by third parties like um, the city runs some, Chevron runs some, UC Berkeley has some. If you look at the monitoring data that's available, the air quality in Richmond looks like it's comparable to, say, San Rafael, which is not pristine by any means. San Rafael is one of our higher polluted areas, but it's not what we expected given all of the pollution sources there. And it's also not what we expected when you look at the, air, the health data for Richmond. And so we expected to find more pollution there than we did. And so the first phase in Richmond was to do this really detailed study of air quality in Richmond. We partnered with a a Silicon Valley company called uh, Aklama to drive every street in Richmond with uh, a mobile monitoring platform at least 20 times and so you can right but how what 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 so phase one is how long phase two is how long how long is it uh, how long have you been trying to put the steering committee together as far as the public is concerned right so that they can start having their input because we've got uh, there's several names that have come across my desk um that are on the steering committee for eb 617 so i just want to know how long that process is as far as um uh, putting that that the, the the committees together so that everyone can sit down at the table and come up with some type of answer so, as to what can be done about air pollution. Right. So there's going to be two steering committees in Richmond. There's a steering committee that's seated now that oversees the monitoring plan. And then we're going to seat a new steering committee um, later this year, um, hopefully later this year, I think is the plan, in order to oversee the emission reduction plan. And so... There's a community design team made up of 10 members of the community who are talking about who should be on this new steering committee, what should that voting structure be like. Mm, So they have to get voted on kind of thing, right? They have to be voted on by their uh, a group of their peers, so to speak. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the the way other air districts have implemented this is they have put up a web, Mm -hmm. you know, put up an application on their website. And then people applied to be on the sure. steering committee, and then the air district picked who was going to be on the steering committee. Um, our model okay. in the Bay Area is we have a community committee that decides who's going to sit on the steering committee and and what the decision-making structure is going to look like on the steering committee. 
So a lot of folks, um, just to just to answer the uh, the clap back, if you would, mm-hmm. from last week's episode, mm-hmm. um, and uh, what uh, 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 community activists uh, for communities for a better environment, Andres Soto had to say about Bachmed, uh, the Bay Area. Um, air quality management district is that there hasn't been enough done uh, as far as your your organization is concerned and uh, that there there hasn't been enough done because of the fact that uh, a lot of the folks are are leaning towards the sides of the polluters if you would just to put them in one group um, what do you say to that? What are your What is your answer to that, Greg Nudd, uh, Deputy Air Pollution Control Officer for Bachman? Well, um, you know we have a long relationship with uh, Communities for a Better Environment, and uh, the Air District and Communities for a Better Environment have a common goal. We don't often agree with the best way to get there, um, and I, I I don't agree with the assessment that there has been any delay in implementation of emission reduction in Richmond. Um, and I don't agree with the assessment that the existing steering committee is somehow um, you know, compromised. I, I, I think we see uh, a good mix of folks on the existing steering committee, um, but it's a steering committee for a monitoring program. And it's not necessarily the same steering committee that you want to have for an emission reduction program. And that's why we're going through this process now to, to build the new steering committee. You know, for example, when we put the initial steering committee together for the monitoring program, um, communities for a better environment um, declined to participate. Uh, another uh, big organization that's active in that area. What was the reason? Um, well, what you have the to ask them directly. I don't want to speak. I don't want to speak for them. Sure. Um, uh, the Asian okay. Pacific, but they didn't give you an answer? They didn't give you any kind of answer? Um, like I said, I, I, don't, I, don't official wanna, answer. I don't want to, I, I don't have anything in writing from them. Um, and I don't want to be, okay. I don't want to be okay. TVE spokesperson. That's, that's for them to sure. say, right? No, no, no. I'm not asking you to. I'm just asking if there was anything solid, a solid answer that they gave to you. I'm not asking you to speak for them at all. Not at all. Not at all. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so, they, dec- so they, they didn't want to They declined it. to participate. Mm-hmm. The Asian Pacific Environmental Network declined to participate. And so um, those are, are a couple of, of key activist groups who've been working in Richmond for many years on these issues. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we gave people who chose not to participate in the monitoring program an opportunity to participate in the design of the emission reduction plan. And so that's why we... Uh, that and because of kind of the the decisions that were made in putting together the monitoring plan steering committee were in the context of what a monitoring plan does as opposed to what an emission reduction plan does. I, I anticipate that this emission reduction plan is going to have some teeth in it and it's going to, um, you know, set the air district on a course for doing regulations that we're not already doing. And so um, we thought it would be good to open up that process again take another look at who's on that committee and what that decision-making process is going to be and make sure that we have a system a system that's set up so that the community voice is dominant in decision-making. All right. Well, hey, there you go. <laughs> Greg Nudd. Greg Nudd is the Deputy Air Pollution Control Officer and oversees the public policy programs at Bachman, the Bay Area Air Quality Air management district i can never get that acronym right but folks you know what i'm trying to say uh, that includes the rural development team the planning and climate protection division the public health office and the community engagement team mr nudd i want to say thank you thank you thank you for taking the time out to talk to us here at a rude awakening and to to answer the criticism and uh, my hope is to keep this conversation going with you and community activists uh like the uh, sunflower alliance uh, organization folks and the uh, communities for a better environment folks and hopefully we'll be able to sit down and have a have a debate you know because when it comes down to folks community is that we're having this conversation um in order to come to some type of a uh, amicable uh, resolution so greg no, thank you so much for being on the show we truly appreciate you taking the time certainly thanks for the opportunity
we are back. We are back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. It's Friday morning, folks. Friday morning. We're going to switch gears just a little bit here. The last segment of the show. I want to talk about an article that was written. Um, this latest feature is in the Cairo Review of Global Affairs entitled A Future Filled with Pathogens. It was written by award-winning journalist and author Dar Jamail. And he's exploring how the human incursion into the natural habitat of animals will become a huge detriment to human life on Earth. Here to discuss it further is the man himself, none other than Dar Jamail. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Sabrina. Thanks. Good to be with you again. Absolutely. Now, I have to read a quote because <laughs> I love quoting you. So I have to read a quote from your article. The warn and it's quote, the warning was this worsening habitat destruction from development, deforestation, the climate crisis and for profit animal exploitation inevitably lead humans to lead to humans becoming infected with zoonosis or diseases transmitted from animals. They would have otherwise never come into contact with COVID-19 is simply the next round of disease driven by deleterious human actions against the earth and uh, it's just um, it, I couldn't sum it up better and I want to drill down into why um, major corporations multinational corporations um, it seems that they're still not heeding the warnings with this pushback to get back to business as usual during this COVID-19 pandemic. And it doesn't seem to make any sense. Is there something that they know that we don't know? Or is it just that the, the craving is greed? Or, or what am I missing here? What are we missing here? Yeah, I, I think it's the obviousness of exactly as you just put it, the craving is greed, where the, the profit making system driving these corporations you know they're they're charter bound to generate profits for their shareholders and so uh literally at, at a point you know and, and the trump administration literally personifies this where uh, it's more important to them to make profits at all costs even at the expense of human lives even even people i mean they've been doing this abroad forever and to, to marginalized uh communities in this country forever too but now uh, it's it's affecting literally everyone, and and so it's 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 that simple. It's where the the insanity of we must generate profits at all costs uh, is is taking precedent over everything, even human life. I think it's really that simple. And really that sick, and really truly that sick. I mean, the United States has topped everyone as far as deaths in regards to COVID-19. And this is just one, this is just one uh, zoonotic disease that has plagued us uh, um, this badly or this harshly. I mean, we have SARS, we've got uh, MERS, uh, then there was also Ebola. Um, but um, I want to go to the section of the article uh, called Climate as a Vector, where you're talking about these different types of um, uh, diseases uh, be that are coming out because of or due to the thawing of permafrost, which is shifting temperatures and rainfall patterns, um, along with human encroachment on uh, wildlife. Talk to us about what that confluence of issues means because we've got the glaciers that are thawing they're they're basically melting away and that's a very well documented <clears throat> excuse me very well documented in your book um the end of ice bearing witness um but talk to us about the shifting temperatures the rainfalls the sea level changing the um the ecology of, of the, the the seas changing uh the dying off of of uh, the um that the reefs, the Great Barrier Reef, is being bleached to death. Uh, talk to us about how all these the, these confluent con, the confluence of all these issues means for us. Well, that's that's really the article. I broke it into two sections. The first, really, mm -hmm. the human encroachment being the primary uh, of going in, and that's essentially what we know for a fact is the cause of COVID nineteen, uh, and and has been the cause of many other. Uh, 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 diseases like this in the past. But uh, the second half of the article really gets into the direct climate impacts. And, you know, the one of the main ways for those is when we raise global temperatures, which we're doing now at record rates on an annual basis. And it just was announced today that 2020 is expected to be 
a, a yet another record warm year for the planet. Uh, that as you raise those temperatures, it allows diseases and their the, their vectors to spread into areas that they hadn't been before. So even, you know, this is why we've seen West Nile virus outbreaks in Dallas, Texas. And that's that kind of trend is expected to continue and push further and further north, uh, driven largely by warming temperatures as well as changes in rainfall patterns. The other way, which is uh, really quite creepy, is when the, the permafrost is Thawing, which it is now, uh, a study was released this past fall showing that it was already thawing at a point that scientists did not expect it to reach for another 70 years. So we're looking at a dramatically accelerating thawing of the Arctic, Arctic permafrost. And it's scary because we even have an example from 2016 in Siberia when a young boy died and at least 20 others were hospitalized there after they were exposed from anthrax that was released from thawing permafrost. It, had, uh, it was from a reindeer carcass that had been infected 75 years prior, which thawed out. And then it, the anthrax was released into the soil and water nearby and people were exposed. And so that kind of thing uh, has scientists referring to permafrost as sort of a Pandora's box of of, of pathogens possibly. And so, uh, you know, a, a, another few things I cited in the article that are were, were quite scary to me was how uh, there was a NASA study, for example, back in 2005, where they were able to actually revive bacteria that had been frozen for 32,000 years. Mm. And then two years later in 2007, scientists revived bacteria from Antarctica that had been frozen for 8 million years. And so while not all bacteria can survive for that long. Some can, and uh, it's actually been proven that they could revive it and then it would become uh, transmittable uh, shortly thereafter. So we don't know what all is, is, is frozen in the permafrost, and we know for a fact that there's different diseases, uh, and anthrax, anthrax as an example. And so the, the fact is, is more and more is thawing out than ever before on an annual basis. And uh, with human encroachment on top of that, uh, people will be exposed. And so many scientists are warning that, look, we're we're literally it's not it's not if it's when. Uh, and, and the disturbing thing is, is we don't really know what's coming. So while there are some measures that can be taken to try to protect and prepare for what's coming in a lot of ways uh we can't mm -hmm. yeah and that's the scary part that is the scary part but we do have organizations like the world health organization now how is the who tackling the likelihood of future zoonotic pandemics i mean uh, is there anything that they can do i mean there, there are these super strains like the COVID 19 um of of flus uh, that are you know they're just you can't fight it with any type of antibiotics that we have available on this earth but um the world health organization is trying to tackle it can you talk about uh, what they're doing well, I, that's right. And they they're doing what they can. But of course, now, you know, in the context of this interview, the timing's uh, sure. perfect or horrible, I guess, depending on how you look at it with just this mm -hmm. week, this ad insane administration uh, uh, making an announcement they want to cut their funding to the WHO in the midst of the worst global pandemic in 102 years, uh, utter insanity. Uh, and and so the WHO is, is doing what it can. It really is the global organization tasked with doing exactly what you just discussed of, of trying to prepare us for uh, what is to come. And so, you know, there's things being done like running climate models, showing the changing uh, temperature and rainfall patterns across the globe and trying to predict the spread of malaria and other diseases that are going to be going into new areas and try to get that information out to hospitals and health systems in those areas so that they can prepare for what's coming. So that's the kind of thing that is, is why the WHO is so important uh, on a global level, because they are, are uniquely suited to do that kind of thing and coordinate directly with global governments uh, uh, to, to prepare people for what is coming. And if they don't do that, then there's going to be a huge, huge gap in preparation. And so uh, I think it's, you know, the, this administration uh, in particular, 
look at how the, what's happening to the United States with COVID-19. This country's right. being decimated and a lot of epidemiologists feel we're still very much on the front end of this thing. Uh, right now, as we speak, a vaccine still isn't expected for another year. And so look at how decimated the United States already is uh, and, and what's going to happen. And, and, and so then picture that with uh, now a WHO that's crippled from less funds from the United States, uh, this attack on science in this country, and it's really setting us up for rather, rather scary things to come. And I think, you know, one of the most, uh, uh, I think, disturbing things about the WHO and how they're unable to really prepare, though, even even if they had full or even more funding, is that what I mentioned earlier, that what many of the scientists that I, I quoted in the article were concerned about is that um, they know that the, the the risk is going to increase with time as more people are exposed to more pathogens from both encroachment and, and climate pattern shifting and thawing permafrost, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. But they can't say with any certainty whatsoever, what are the diseases going to be? Where is it right. going to happen and at what point? So there's just mm -hmm. too many unknown factors. And so that's why more than ever today, it's important to ramp up funding for things like the WHO and other groups tasked like this and scientists studying it so that they can learn more and try to fill in those blanks and get more information to make better decisions and make better preparations for what is coming. And instead, we're literally seeing the opposite, funding being cut, science under attack, and uh, a healthcare system here that uh, you don't even, you know, uh, you don't need me to tell you uh, the, the state that that's in. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's uh, it, it, we're living in a scary, scary time. Um, the United States is a scary, scary place. This world, this country, um, this 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 earth, is beyond scary. Dar Jamil, wow, wow, wow! Thank you so much again, folks. Again, his latest article is in. The Cairo Review of Global Affairs, and it is entitled A Future Filled with Pathogens, A Future Filled with Pathogens. Mr. Dar Jamil, thank you so much for taking the time out uh, to do this interview and to tell us exactly where we're headed. Because a lot of folks, they, you know, they got the blinders on, you know, they got their MAGA hats on. <laughs> they're, just not, they're not seeing the forest for the trees for whatever reason. But uh, thank you so much for, for writing this article and, and bringing all this important information to our attention. Thank you. My pleasure, Sabrina. Thanks again for having me. All right. That was Dar Jamil and Mr. Radiki. Let's get that theme music rolling here. That does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. A big thank you to my guests, Leah Redwood, Craig Nudd, and Mr. Dar Jamil for taking the time. The music on the show was from Get the Blessing, Bukani Mowefu, and that's Andrea Turner's uh, Keep Your Face Owen, oh, Andrea Turner's uh, band. And of course, Radiohead. This edition was produced by yours truly. Julie and Laura Purpose, with contributions by Sandra Kwok, Shoshana Weschler, and KPFA's community liaison, Carol Wolfley, with technical direction from Antonio Ortiz and Brian David. Rod Aquila is holding it down on the controls. Rebroadcast of Democracy Now! is coming up next, and stay tuned after that for the best Friday lineup on radio, folks. The best Friday lineup on radio. We've got economic update coming up. Voices of the Middle East and North Africa. Andres Soto with El Show de Andres Soto. It's going down. And then, of course, closing it out with the Project Censored in the afternoon. I'll be back next week. Same time, same place. And remember, community, embrace each other as you embrace the mother of us all. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great weekend.
Hi, this is Eileen Alfandari. KPFA has made changes to our program schedule to keep the station work environment as safe as possible with many fewer people at our studios. Staff are broadcasting from home whenever possible. We're repeating some of your favorite programs in the evening. KPFA is working harder than ever to bring you news and information about the coronavirus pandemic and its impacts on our community in the Bay Area and around the world. Thank you for supporting 94.1 FM and listening to KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.